Time is quarter to seven and we haven't done one of these in a very long time. Let's get everyone to turn on their cameras and say hello and good evening everyone. Ooh. Hello Ella, welcome. Hi. Hi. Oh, we've got we're getting a lot of echo coming back from somewhere. We just have to double check if anyone's listening in the next room. So Ella, talk again and let's hear how you're doing. I'm doing well, thank you. And how are you doing? You, you know are the, you are the main person. You know something? I wish that was true. Only my mother believes that. Well, I tell you, I underline it. Tell you, mom, I'm with her. <laughs> I, she's watching, so I'm sure she's she's good heard that. show, good show. <laughs> so and at the same at the same time, I'd like to ask you to introduce me to your mum. Okay, like we to... we can we can do that probably not tonight because I don't know what she's wearing, so I'd hate <laughs> to turn on her camera. Whatever <laughs> she's with, she's your mother, so she's a. <laughs> A wonderful person to produce such a, 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 a such a wonderful such a clever smart young man it was a freak of accident <laughs> a freak of accident <laughs> very good well said, well said. but so, i want to tell you yes, you, yeah, tell me. you are a, a really very very smart and clever person i love to listen to you and more likely, I prefer to read your articles. You're a, you're brilliant. Oh no, no, that's a that's a gross overstatement. But what I do do well I, is I get I, I get fantastic I people together. You. Are you entitled to be wrong? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with you. Like, <laughs> when can we meet? First, you, before I meet you, mum, when can I meet you in person and shake hands? Shalom Aleichem. I promise my next visit to Cape Town, I, I was there last weekend, but my next visit to Cape Town, I promise I'm, com I'm coming. Are you, are you, what can you cook me? Do I what? Sorry. What can you cook me? What can I cook? Yes. That's, that's in the past. I don't cook anymore. I, what? I eat what is being cooked for me. Okay. <laughs> not, a, not even I'm an to feel the fish. And I'm an old person. I can't stand and cook now. You know, I am. I am in the in the nineties. I, I thought a little, a little <laughs> maybe in the eighties. <laughs> I'm in the late 90s, so uh, I don't cook. I expect people to cook for me, my family. <laughs> well, Henry sent me a message today and he says, next next Shabbat is Shabbat Nachamu, your birthday, where we know you, you're becoming 101 years old, please God. And everyone's coming to Cape Town for that. And I thought maybe you'd make them some gefilte fish, maybe some gribbiness. Oh, I make wonderful gefilte. I used to make very good and Polish, Pol Polish cooked with a little bit of sweetness in the fish, which I know the Litvakers don't like. You know something? Well, let's let's dis discuss with whoever cooks for you. When I come visit you in Cape Town, they can get, make me some proper Polish gefilte fish. Oh, I will try and make it. I will try. I do my best. <laughs> For you, anything, anything. Oh, Ella, Ella, that's amazing. <laughs> Let's get Jordi and Gavi to turn on their, their microphones as well. The time's about 10 to 7. We're going to go live at 7 o'clock. But until then, we chat to everyone who's in the room. And we, uh, we have a good conversation. And we also, of course, want to uh, see what's happening in everyone's life. So, so Gabby, welcome. Nice to have you here. You are the one who has pushed for quite a while and yeah. said we have to do this webinar and we were waiting for the right moment. 101 seems like a fantastic time to do it. Don't you know that it's the, the first rule of being a producer as you need to be pushy, you need to get things done. So it is correct that I was the one pushing for this. Um, but firstly, hello, Ella. It is so wonderful to see you. 
um, and Howie, we are so happy to be here to um, share this film with our special community. Um, it's something that for a long time has been exclusively in festivals, so it's just really great to have this opportunity to share the film with everyone. So, so we're going to talk about filmmaking generally for the next few minutes because we're going to keep the actual content till after seven o'clock. But Jordi, what is it like working with Gabby? Is, is, is having a producer that strong just a complete and utter nightmare? Remember we live, Jordi. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, so thank God, Gabby and I, we work, we work really well together and um, and you can see we've we've done two projects together, and we're actually working and we're shooting next month on the on the next project. And Gabby, we're actually swapping roles. So Gabby's going to be directing and writing, and I'm going to be producing. So I'll get a little opportunity to be the to be the pushy one. Um, so you for, for say you say two projects. Tell us about the other project. The one obviously we're going to see tonight. Tell us about the second project. So the the second project was a, a short Afrikaans film that was commissioned by CakeNet. Um, they choose around 14 short films that they commission every year and those films um, that they fund and then they screen them at the, at the they, they run something called Silver Scam Fierce, which is the big um, Afrikaans film festival in South Africa. And uh, yeah, we, we were one of the projects that were selected uh, last year. We shot last year and then we, um, thank God, the project re went really well and we actually ended up winning best short film, best script and the Audience Choice Award at the at the festival this year, so they've given us a, a shot in different roles now for a, for another one, which is really exciting. So, Gabby, tell us as well. You've won some awards for the movie about Ella, the I'm Here movie, also. Yeah, so um, it's been quite a remarkable journey with I Am Here because when when we started, we weren't really sure of how the reception would be. Um, in any communities, but also communities that maybe don't necessarily know about the Holocaust. Um, but thank God the film, and it's a testament, um, as everyone will see, to Ella, her personality, the remarkable story she shares, um, and how she's overcome trauma with such positivity that people are really resonating with her. So the film has won um, quite a few audience awards at different film festivals around the world. Um, and in South Africa last year, the Durban International Film Festival won Best South African Documentary, um, the Audience Choice Award, and it was also actually the most streamed film at the festival, um, which, which was quite um, rare. And um, Geordie's also won a few Best Director Awards um, uh, off the back of I Am Here. So it's really took us, I think, by, su by surprise. So Ella, not everyone gets a movie made about their life. But excuse me. When you talk to me, I'd like you to talk a little bit slower, please, if I may. Sure. So I say, not everybody gets a movie made about their life. When was the first time that they approached you with this idea to make a documentary movie about you? I didn't know it wasn't going to be a documentary. Just Jordi got me into his films, I didn't know what is going to happen, but I told him my story and he decided to build on this, on, on my story. He said he decided to make a film and he did it slowly. We had different people working with us, uh, Italiano and, and, and uh, Espanol different uh, staff that he had with him in production of the film. Do you understand what I said? Of course, in, mul in multiple languages. <laughs> <laughs> you so, must so I, spoke in, I spoke in German. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> so talk to us, Jordi, about the state of the filmmaking industry in South Africa at the moment. Is it growing? Has it recovered after, after COVID? And, and is there money to fund amazing South African stories like the story of Ella? So, yeah, I, I think, so Gabby and I, we've really um, been digging our heels into the industry here for, for the past few years. Um, and yeah, I think there's massive, massive room for, um, for growth. And I think the industry here is really exciting, not only as a service industry for, 
for big productions that come from the US or for, from the UK that actually come and film in South Africa. But I think um, South Africa is in a really incredible place with streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon's hiring staff in South Africa um, that's going to be announced hopefully in the next month or so. So really people are really flocking to South Africa for its rich um, roots of storytelling. Um, and yeah, I think I think the, the recovery, we, we, we attended now at the Durban Film Festival um, a few weeks back, uh, a session about the, you know, the, the impact of, of the industry post COVID. And I think, you know, the, the, it, it hit the industry very hard, but the growth and uh, bouncing back has been really phenomenal. And there's so much potential um, in the in the industry, in the film industry and entertainment industry here. Um, and also Gabby and I, we're very, very thankful because um, we actually, we've received our first government grant from the NFEF to, uh, to work on a, a document, uh, sorry, not a documentary, a narrative series, limited series. Um, so we've gotten the first devel um, development funding uh, we've been awarded from the NFEF, which is really fantastic. So it looks like they are um, giving opportunities to young up and coming filmmakers and they, um, yeah, they're supporting stories that need to be told, which is really just uh, reassuring and fantastic. So Gabi, has Netflix changed all of this? Is there now a platform where you can actually go sell a movie like this uh, so it can be seen by South Africans? And have we sold the rights to South Africa yet for I Am Here? Um, all good questions. Not all of them I can answer. <laughs> um, but um, I think that what, what streaming has done is um, it's, it's made people are quite used to watching stories that don't take place necessarily in their country. People are more and more used to watching things, um, you know, in Italian or Spanish with subtitles. Um, and what Netflix has really done is is focused on um, stories that show authenticity um, and realizing that actually authentic stories, no matter the nationality, will resonate globally. So I think that's definitely changed the landscape in terms of the way that people consume stories and also um, gives people the opportunity, gives people like us the opportunity to um, get remarkable stories um, shown globally. And as Jordi mentioned, you know, it's also creating um, more opportunities because Netflix was the first big international streamer to come here. Um, but as Jordi mentioned, Amazon will be here um, soon acquiring content. So I think it's also going to be um, there'll be a great, um, I think, competitive um, landscape for for buying films. Um, we do have we've we've got a sales agent that has um, rights internationally, um, and we are yeah we're speaking to some distributors at the moment um, to see where the best platform is um, for it to sit in South Africa. Um, obviously, in each continent, there are different ways to access um, the audience that you want. So it's really been um, quite a process of figuring out how to reach our audience. So, Jordi, the question that I have to ask, which makes this very much a Jewish question, I once went to go see Jackie Mason in New York. And he says, when you come see a show, the non-Jewish people who come see the show all say, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it fantastic theater? Isn't it fantastic that the theater is so full? And the Jewish people walk into the theater and they say, oh, 2,000 seats at $150. You know how, how much money this man is making tonight. <laughs> so, so, so the most Jewish question I ask is for those people who are watching tonight, who are thinking about film as a career, is this a career that you can actually make some money out of and support your family? Sure, that's a, a great question. Um, and I think it's, it's a question that Gabby and I are still kind of learning the answer to because a lot of the the films that we um that we've worked on um you know for instance the 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 cake net film that we did last year the the budget was so minuscule that we we literally didn't make anything off it it was just like a publicity um sort of thing and i think even for the the cake net thing that we're doing now for the for this short film it's a very a very similar thing so it's almost like but I, but i think what we have done in the past few years with the documentary and with the short film is that we've really cemented ourselves and dug our heels in the industry here. So um, I do believe that the, you know, there's lots of money to be, to be made and a great career, but I think you have to get your hands dirty and you really, really have to spend the first few years um, 
you know, making sacrifices and, and uh, blood, sweat and tears in order to actually get there, because I think it's a very competitive industry. But um, what we've learned from uh, from people um, leaps and bounds ahead of us in the industry over the past few years has just been absolutely phenomenal. So we're looking forward to getting to that stage that you mentioned of being able to, um, you know, support ourselves or family, but, uh, but we're on the, on track, which is, which is great. <laughs> Fantastic answer. Well, the time has just gone 7 PM and it seems like absolutely ages since we did one of these, we took about a four month break. The last webinar we did was just before Pesach and we took a bit of break because we thought life was returning to normal. But literally every single day, I get four or five emails or WhatsApp requests to say, when are you starting your webinars again? So I think people decided I had enough of a break and we're back. And I'm so delighted that tonight, we're not just back with an ordinary webinar, but we're back with the most remarkable story and probably one of the most remarkable people in South Africa. So a huge welcome this evening to, to Ella Blumenthal, Ella, tonight we celebrate a week in advance, 101 years. Next Shabbat, Shabbat Nachamu, you turn 101 years old. Tell us, what does that feel like? Do you still feel like you're an 18-year-old inside? Exactly. You're very close to it. I am still young. If you want to test me, come along next time when you're in, in Cape Town and we will dance. I will teach you a polka or a tango, I know you know, or a waltz. So try it, try me. So Ella, we were talking just a little bit. Oh, wait. And if you want to swim, we go to this swimming pool and we'll see who comes first, you or me. <laughs> you know something? I'm not putting any money on me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, jo Jordi and Gabby, tell us, how did the idea of this film actually start and, and begin? Unmute yourself, Gabby, as well, please. You must ask this question. Jordi will give you an answer. Mm. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, the, the project really started, I, I was very uh, lucky to grow up um, in Cape Town, South Africa, um, and in the same community that Ella used to spend a lot of her time with her daughter. And so growing up, I have these, these memories of Ella um, almost being a celebrity in the shul. And I, and I remember one Friday night, we, we went uh, somewhere for Shabbat dinner, and sort of un unannounced Ella just stood up and started telling some of her story and I believe it was about an experience that she had when she was taking her and Roma into a gas chamber and I just remember you know we all didn't expect this it was a Friday night Shabbat dinner and and we were all just brought to tears by hearing her story and a few moments later like only Ella could do she was dancing she was singing she was playing with the kids and she really just was the life of the party and and I remember from a very young age looking at this remarkable woman and thinking, how could someone who's been through one of the darkest moments in history be the oh my God, look, uh, look at her. So be the light and be the sorry, be we the, have we have someone on who uh, who is unmuted. Um, so we just need to find who who they are and get them muted. Cool. Sorry, you were saying, Jordan? Sure. So, so I just remember being very struck by Ella from a very young age, and it was the start of a beautiful, a beautiful relationship. And um, at the beginning of 2019, um, um, I was looking for a project to to start, and Ella was turning 98 that year at the time. And you know, it, it sort of just felt like the perfect opportunity to to tell her story and to um and to share it with the world um and that's when i approached gabby and um and we started collaborating on this on this incredible project 
So we're going to welcome everyone who's watching us this evening, and then we're going to come back and talk about the creation of the movie. Then we're actually going to show the full movie. It's about 70 minutes, but it's gripping and it's a remarkable story. And then we're going to come back with uh, Dr. Kanan Bushkin, and we're going to talk about Ella's life lessons that she has for all of us. And Ella, we're going to talk about resilience. We're going to talk about mental strength. We're going to talk about keeping physically active. And we're going to talk about the lessons that you have for all of us, not just from 101 years, but lessons from being in three concentration camps, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, and the life lessons that you bring. Because how many children and grandchildren are there now uh, stemming from your yourself? Really, yes. I, I tell you, I don't like to count. I, I'm very superstitious. But whatever I've got, let it be well, strong, and healthy, and happy. Amen. Amen. So a big welcome to everyone tonight who's watching us from around the world. Just a reminder, first of all, this is brought to you by the South African Jewish Report newspaper. If you haven't seen the latest edition of the Jewish Report newspaper, please pick up a copy at your local school, your shul, your garage shop, CNA, even look if you're staying in a block of flats or townhouse complex, we deliver to hundreds of those around the country. Also, if you don't want a physical copy, you can go online to www.sajr.co.za and you can download either the full edition there or alternatively, you can look at each individual article itself. A very important announcement is that we have in fact started nominations for the APSA Jewish Achiever Awards 2022. So if you look in your Jewish Report newspaper, you can see the theme is Back to Life. I think tonight we're celebrating an amazing life story. And we want to celebrate the fact that so many of us have returned back to life in the last bits of the post-COVID pandemic. So we want you to go and celebrate with us this year the Jewish Achiever Awards are going to be a massive, massive party. But we're also going to honor business icons and lifetime achievers and women in leadership and uh, community service and humanitarian people and entrepreneurs and people involved in the arts, sports, science and culture. And we want you to nominate. Last year, we had in excess of 400 nominees. So we'd like you to please go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash J-A-A, which obviously stands for Jewish Achiever Awards 2022 nominate. And please go nominate people that you believe are worthy to be winners this year of the APSA Jewish Achiever Awards 2022. It is really such an exciting process and honor. And so tonight, as we start our webinar series again, we're starting with the amazing story of Ella Blumenthal. Here I am, and 101. And we can now give you news of our next webinar. On the 18th, we have Sarai Kumalo, the first Black African woman to conquer Everest. And she's going to come and tell us the story, how she failed twice, how she managed to get up the mountain, and what she learned by being the first Black African woman to conquer Everest and life itself. And then another amazing announcement, many of you have seen because we had tens of thousands of people watching, when Bill Browder, author of Red Notice, came on our webinar and told the amazing story of his fight with Vladimir Putin. And he's got a new book out. I don't know if you've read it, Freezing Order. It is as good, if not better, than Red Notice. And it's the continuation of the story, the continuation of the story of him and Vladimir Putin now slogging it out in the US court system and how he lives in constant fear of being arrested and sent back to Russia or sent to Russia to face Vladimir Putin in courts that maybe are not quite just. He's coming back on the 1st of September at eight o'clock. And we're so excited to in fact have Bill Browder with us then. So we've got an amazing series of webinars coming up. And before we really begin tonight, I wanna to wish everyone uh, watching, today is Women's Day. Today we're celebrating not just Ella, but we're celebrating the amazing achievements and the contribution that all women make in South Africa. So Ella, if you have a message to women in South Africa, what would you tell us? I would say we should always get 
together and discuss things and talk and, and tell the world what we are thinking, what we would do to improve the life of not only women, but all the people in the world. So clearly, Jordi, you're telling us how the concept of the, the, uh, the movie came about, but tell us what you learned by, by creating this movie together with Anna. Wow. I, I was, <laughs> is, is it for me? No, for Jordi. <laughs> let, let Jordi tell us what he learned by working with you. It's, it's, yo, Howard, it's hard to, to sum up in, in, in you know, I could probably, probably do a full web webinar of all the things I've learned from Ella, but um, I think one of the, the, the key things I learned with her is just to, you know, in, in, in anything that you do in life and all the hardships that you go through in life, it's just to, you know, to, to see it all with a, you know, Ella has this, this attitude where she looks at something and no matter how hard it is, you know, she, she says, um, you know, my wife and I, we, we often look at one another and we, when we're going through something difficult and we say, what would Ella do? And I think Ella just has this way about her where she looks at something and she always sees, sees the glass half, half full and she always is able to, to rise above any challenges. So I think that's something that I'm really trying to inculcate in my life is to always look at the world through Ella's eyes and uh, to, to take that little, little, distill a little bit of her strength um, into my own life. So tonight we've got thousands and thousands of people watching uh, this movie tonight and watching the discussion tonight. And some of people are watching on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, please click the like and subscribe button so we can notify you about our future webinars as well. If you're watching on, on uh, Zoom, please also comment and chat to us in the chat section so you can be part of the conversation that we're having. So Gabby, tell us your, your, your uh, part in all of this. You get involved. This is a new story for you. And suddenly you sucked into a world that maybe is slightly different to the world that you've grown up in. You need to tell the story in an engaging way of someone who's been through hell and back, but has really changed her lives and the lives of so many people around us. How do you start on a project like that? We're going to see animation involved in it. How do you actually tell the story as a storyteller in, in, in a movie that's got such highs and lows in it? I think that's, um, you framed the question really beautifully because, you know, both Jordi and I grew up in Jewish day schools. We were very familiar, of course, with the history of the Holocaust and had also watched many Holocaust testimonies. Um, but when we met um, Ella and decided it was her story that, that we wanted to highlight, um, we really realized this isn't a story, this isn't a Holocaust story or a Holocaust history lesson. This is a film about a woman who's overcoming trauma with such positivity, with boundless energy, with this remarkable zest for life. So in order to highlight Ella and her personality, we think once we decided that was our goal, um, everything else became a lot simpler. We decided um, really to, to focus on, um, on that positivity. Um, when you watch the film now, you'll see um, the day-to-day -day life that Ella lives, how, how she reflects on things, as Jordi says, um, in such a positive manner. But you mentioned with regards to animation, um, you know, I think growing up and looking, watching black and white stock footage sometimes can be um, either quite, yeah, you know, it's quite alienating, it's quite distant, um, it's quite historical. And so we decided to use animation to bring Ella's um, past and her memories to life for a few reasons. I think the, the one is the audience can walk alongside Elia in a way that you can't do with stock footage. But in animation, we can fly with Ella. We can um, really be present in these magical moments. Um, so I think animation allowed us a lot of opportunities that, that using only stock footage or talking heads interviews maybe couldn't. Um, and really, we were guided by Ella, we were guided by her personality and her story, and that informed the, the storytelling and visual techniques that we chose to employ. 
So just a note to everyone, we've managed to get the chat on. So the chat is now on. Please tell us where you're watching around the world to answer the questions that have already been asked. Of course, we are about to be showing uh, the documentary this evening, uh, and we would love to hear your comments and your understandings on that as, as well. So Ella, the last word that is coming from you before we show the documentary, and then we're going to come back and chat about, about it. But Ella, what do you think we should look out for? What are the key themes that come from the documentary that you'd like people to really understand as they watch it? First of all, I want to know what human beings could do to other human beings without turning the head ahead and just killing people, weitermachen, verfluchte Jude, schweine Hunde, and treat other people like cattle and eat and worse. That is the first thing that I wanted people to know, and especially the deniers. Therefore, I think it's most important that as many people as possible, as could be, that see the film. And Ella, you in fact reached out recently to a Holocaust denier. Tell just a, during you reached out to an anti Semite recently, yeah. and you offered to meet with her to tell her yeah. your your story. Did she respond? She never came up. She, I've never heard from her. Oh, you know about it. I'm so glad. Would you tell everybody? Tell us the story. Tell us the story, please. There was just, I got a, a, a note on the, that the Holocaust, oh no, it's not me. It was for everybody. You are, it's a lie. It's never happened. Hitler never existed. He didn't, he didn't hurt people. He didn't, he didn't kill people. It's a lie. So I, 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 I got a note to her to tell me, they come to me and sit down and discuss with me. And then you'll see that she is wrong. That it's not correct. That she was just spoken to somebody and and, 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 and she thinks that she's right, but I've never heard of her. She never came back to me and I'm still waiting. I never gave up. I think I'll find her one day. She's a Pretoria woman. I've got to find her. I've got to bring her to, to, for everybody to listen. Thank you. So now let's ask everyone, Turn off your cameras, turn off your sound. Let's watch the documentary that comes from Sanctuary Films, from Jordi Sank and Gabby Bloomberg, the story of Ella, and then we're going to come back and have a discussion about the movie and about Ella's life. If we can ask, please, everyone to turn on their cameras and we'll resume this discussion now. We're joined by Hanan Bushkin. And let's make sure that we get Ella's camera turned on as well so we can, we can see her. But what an amazing story. And to Gabby and to Jordi, just a huge thank you for allowing us to show this this evening. And I think to inspire so many people about the remarkable stories in our own community and the resilience and the strength that Ella's really shown, that really is a great, unbelievable, um, uh, I think, lesson for, for all of us. Hanan, Ella asked the question, why was I chosen to survive? But my sense is, 
she made that choice herself. Right. So survivor's guilt is a very common phenomena that we witnessed um, from Holocaust war survivors. Why me? But one thing that uh, was very apparent, and very clear, is that she possessed this amazing ability to commit to a state of survival, not giving up, maintaining what we call an unconditional attitude of strength and bravery, committing to getting out. And that's one thing that we saw among survivors is that whilst many were physically weak, the ones that coped and survived are the ones that maintained this attitude of wanting to chase a much bigger goal than the moment. Not marrying moments, but rather marrying the future, which is I am going to see my family again. I am going to get out. I am going to tell my story. I am going to finish my book. I am going to go back home. Uh, I'm going to change people's minds. Um, I'm not going to keep this as a secret. And that's what kept them going. This amazing pursuit of something bigger than the moment allowed them to cope and thrive, for sure. Ella, if we can ask you, you've watched the movie now, I think, many, many times. When you watch it, does it feel real? Does it feel part of your life? Or do you feel almost like an outsider looking in to watch the movie about yourself? No, not at all like an outsider. I feel... I feel I, I'm going through it again. I'm reliving it again. And this, 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 these comments that you had in the movie, and I want to read to you some of the comments that I wrote down as you were speaking, yes. where you said, I never, ever lost hope. Yes. I was not ready to die. Yes. And if we survive, we will tell the world what these murderers did to us. Yes. And my will to survive was so strong. Where do you think you got the strength from in order to, to continue to just get up every morning? And you ask me, I can't answer you really. It was in me, the strength of survival I'm repeating again was in me so strong that I felt I must go on. Whatever the sufferings I'm going through, I've got to tell the world, I'm repeating my own words, what these murderers have done to us. I wanted to survive. I wanted to live. And I looked after Roma. And we did it. We made it with God's help. I'm here sitting, listening to you. I watched the film again. And I, I don't know what it was, but it was a power in me. It was not what a normal person goes through. I, there was a godly strength in me. So, Hanan, do you think that part of the secret of Ella's survival was the fact that she had meaning? She had to keep her niece alive. She had to keep Roma alive. Do you think that was part of I, this? I, 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 Ella, I, I'm asking Hanan if he thinks that you found meaning in your, your desire to keep Roma, your niece, alive. And that may have contributed towards you, the strength that you found in order to survive. Hanan, no. what do you think? Or we, Ella first? It was part of it. It was part of it. No, it was the strength that I wanted, it was for her and it was for me that I wanted to live, I wanted to go on. I knew that I've got nobody else left in the world, only Rome. 
Kanan, your thoughts? So um, I studied Viktor Frankl extensively. No. And, oh, uh, and uh, for those who don't know, Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor and he survived four concentration camps. Um, and he witnessed something really interesting. He saw that a lot of physically strong men did not make it, but yet physically weak men made it through. And he wondered how come. And he found, and he tells stories of families being led into the gas chambers, but yet on the way there, they were smiling and dancing and singing. And he said, everything can be taken of a man except the last of all human freedoms, the freedom to choose one's own attitude. And for a while, I wondered, what is attitude? It's a little bit too airy fairy for me. And the moment I defined attitude as follows, it completely trans transcended my view of human nature. And attitude is defined as a commitment to how the story ends, a commitment to how the story ends. And the moment you can commit to an ending of your desire, and that's up to you. And never mind that is your choice to commit to how the story ends, but it is your responsibility to commit to an ending of your choice. I always say in my favorite quote of all time, is if you're not the chess player of your life, you're a pawn in someone else's. If you don't choose your way, you'll live somebody else's way. If you don't serve your God, you'll serve somebody else's God. And people will say, well, what if I, what if I don't serve any God? Well, then you get depressed. You have to chase something. And what Ella did is she committed to getting out. She committed to surviving. She committed to looking after Roma. She committed to telling the story. She committed to not hiding the truth and that's what kept her going. There was such a powerful force pulling her towards those goals, those personal meanings that did not allow her to stay and stick to the suffering of the moment. That was very powerful. So I, I want to come back in a minute and I want to talk about the importance of being able to tell our stories whether it's this story or whether it's other stories, because Ella, you told us when you came to South Africa, your husband's family said, remove your, from your arm, remove your tattoo. Don't talk okay. about it. And I want to come back in a moment and talk about silence and what silence does to us if we don't tell these stories. But before we have that discussion, because I think Gabby and Jordi are very important in that discussion as well, the ability to tell these stories, we want to give people an opportunity to celebrate your birthday, your 101st birthday next week, by making a donation to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center in your name and in your honor, so they can continue to tell these stories in the way Ella, you and Gabby and Jordi have all done as well. So we're going to watch a one minute uh, story about the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And then we're going to come back and talk about the importance of having these stories told. This Women's Day, it is an honor to be part of Ella Blumenthal's 101st birthday and to be part of this special screening of I'm Here. There are in South Africa only 20 to 25 Holocaust survivors and we need to capture all their story. We need to tell their story. We welcome schools from all walks of life every day to tell those stories, to remember, to educate, to learn lessons for humanity in order for the words never again to become a reality. <laughs> We will play that again. And Gabby, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, in the chat to put the donation link for the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, please, because I, we would love it if people celebrated Ella's 101st birthday with a donation to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. But Ella, tell us the story. When it came to people saying, don't speak, don't tell the story, remove the tattoo, 
when did you feel that silence was enough and that you had to tell the story so we could all learn? We used to meet in Johannesburg, some of us Holocaust survivors. And we used to, while we meet, we were talking to each other. Some of us were telling our, our own stories while we, we, we met to, together for tea. And we used to meet actually I remember once a week in Johannesburg at the Berea Shul, next to the Berea Shul, and we used to talk to each other and meet and discuss. But we weren't talking to, to outside, to the, to, the, uh, to the people outside, because we felt, I'm coming back to myself, I uh, st uh, was told by my, by my husband's family not to discuss. Uh, that's why they advised me to take, to remove my number. And, and I was trying to mix in with, with all the other people, with the normal people. I tried to forget about my past life. And it didn't work, unfortunately, it was always with me. But I only started to talk long, long afterwards when my children were already getting a little bit bigger. Then I started to talk. And I, I just can't remember why, what made me talk. Maybe because I was asked and I felt this was the time. I want to leave a legacy. I want to tell the world what was happening to me. So I started to talk. Hanan, we, we heard from Ella's children that they would hear her scream at night. Whether you're talking or not talking, the trauma of our past remains with us. What do we do about that? So First of all, talking about it is important for two reasons. It's important for the person that's been through it because the human brain really likes to make sense of its world. And when we go through trauma and especially such grave injustice, the brain can't comprehend that. It goes into a short circuit because it doesn't make sense. And talking about it allows you to put the pieces together and find meaning in the story. The second reason why it's important to talk about it is we need to let people hear from person that went through it there's a big difference between reading it in a book or seeing it in a movie or seeing it in a spell book film to actually hearing it from the survivors themselves using their own voice their own stories uh, their own message their own tears seeing it especially for youngsters that unfortunately are not going to have grandparents that can tell them the stories it is important because that's real life that's real life it's not imagined it's not a fantasy, it's not a horror story, it's real life that has happened and never again, can only be never again, if we completely believe that it's happened, we integrate it, we hear it from the real survivors. The trauma, unfortunately, when somebody goes through a loss or a trauma, it's not about erasing it, it's about living with it. You carry a big bag of potatoes and the bag of potatoes never goes away. You just find a way to walk with it in a different way that makes it a little bit more bearable. The scars never go away, not the physical scars and not the emotional scars, but you work through it and you work around it. We unfortunately don't have the mechanism to forget. And as Ella was saying, if she could do it all again, she would because she's the person that she is today because of these stories. And uh, even if we offer these individuals to forgive, a lot of them would not take it back because it's made them the person and the people that are today. You have to continue telling the story. The one thing that I see in my practice a lot of survivors and people that have gone through incredible traumatic events is they want to just forgive and forget and let it go and not think about it. But that's not how it works. You want to be able to integrate it, integrate the story, understand it a different way, find meaning, appreciate the person that you are because of the story. And remember, human nature 
can move on and heal and still feel a sense of memory and a sense of hurt and a sense of grief at the same time. We can move forward and grieve at the same time. So for sure, it's about telling the story over and over until it resonates or integrates and it makes sense. Gabby and Jordi, you, you were the ones who had really the honor and privilege to be able to bring the story to all of our lives. Tell us how, how, how do you guys feel about it? And, and how, I mean, you, I think you've done beautiful justice to an amazing story and a remarkable human being. But how do we keep on telling these stories? Because otherwise the younger generation don't know. And the broader society, this isn't top of their agenda. How do we continue to educate people and keep the horrors of what humanity can do top of mind to all of us? Jordi, do you want to go first? Sure. I think, you know, I, I think there's something amazing about empowering the younger generation um, to also find ways to, to share these stories. I saw an amazing video of a, um, a Holocaust survivor with her grandson on TikTok. And, you know, that, that speaks to a whole new generation of, 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 you know, hearing Holocaust survivors' stories and the reach that it can have. Similarly to, to Gabby and I, you know, we started on this project and we knew we had to share the, the importance of the message of Ella's story and also tell it in a, in a new dynamic way so that it was palatable to a younger generation. Um, so I, I really think it's, it's, you know, and we work with the center, we work with Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center to find educational ways. And we work in an educational syllabus and program now with them to find ways that make the story really resonate with younger generations. And we very, very strongly believe in empowering younger filmmakers, younger storytellers, um, and, you know, people to, to find innovative ways of keeping the, the message of never again alive so that these injustices never happen um, in the future. I think just to, to add, as, um, as Jordi was saying, we really, when we, when we filmed Ella's story, um, we were very cognizant that she was 98 years old and that we're very privileged to be, um, to be, to be able to meet Holocaust survivors. Um, as we saw in the Johannesburg Holocaust genocide video, um, there are less than 30 Holocaust survivors um, in South Africa. So I think we, we, we realized that we had this opportunity to capture Ella's story. Um, and I suppose, fortunately and unfortunately, the, you know, the message is still, is still relevant. Um, we don't just see anti-Semitism, but we see xenophobia, we see othering on a daily basis. And, you know, Jordi and I were thinking, how do we use um, our skills and our career to share, um, share what happens when discrimination gets taken to the extreme? Um, so for us, filmmaking was was that answer. But I think how we, you know, how do people keep stories alive, each each in their each with their own talents um, and in their own individual way? And you know, for us, we just knowing Ella, not just her story, but but as we've been discussing now, how she's overcome this trauma with such positivity um, is is what made us realize that we needed to to capture this and make it. Um, and, and share it with, with, with everyone. And uh, I see that Milton Lutron, who's watching, says that he heard you tell the story of being in Miller 17. Can you tell us briefly that story? Which story is it? I didn't get it, I'm sorry. The was story, it? story of Miller 17. No, it wasn't Miller 17. Where did you get it? Of Miller, 18, 18, Mil 18. Tell, tell us what Miller 18 was. It was a normal uh, building with flats where people used to live. But when we moved in, when I say we, it was Rauma, myself, and a few young people and another, um, a man that saw us uh, breaking up a doorway, he says, I am coming to hide behind this room. The building was empty because the people were uh, all deported. 
but we found one building that we uh, we bricked up the doorway to the next room and we shifted over a, ma a wardrobe, a mahogany cupboard, so that one couldn't see that there is another room. Are you with me? Yeah. That when we walked up one more floor, the flat was there also set out exactly the same as our below. We found a spot leading to the to our bricked up room and we broke through the floor and this spot and we broke through the uh, ceiling and we we walked down no we, we moved down we onto the bricked up room are you with me am i clear we move them on a on a step ladder onto a wardrobe and then down on the floor. That was on Mila 19, a building of flats, which was opposite Mila 18. And this Mila 18 was the headquarters of the underground Jewish uh, organization. Ella, Joss asks us for you to speak a little bit of Yiddish for a minute and to tell us. Sure. Was, to tell was us, so, so Joss wants, wants you to describe in Yiddish for one minute what was like to have Shabbos in your home before the war. Oh, Shabbos. Oh, Shabbos. 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 Also schön, also lichtig, mit feine, heiße äh, äh, Halles und der Tat hat gemacht, Kiddisch und die Kinder ähm, gesessen herum und die Mama gesessen auf der anderen Seite und, und, die, und nach dem, also wir haben gegessen und wir gesingen des Mieres, meine Brüder mit meinen Taten. Um gesingen ins Mieres. Ai, ja, 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 Ella, that's an amazing, the amazing rendition. I'm going to ask my mother to translate that for me. Um, but uh, we we have a question about the removal of your tattoo. Do yeah. you have Do you have regrets? Um. Yes and no, because I was in business here in South Africa and I couldn't have walked around with the, with the number in the world, even if I wasn't in the business. People do, couldn't understand I walked with the number. It was, I, it's difficult for, to say, I, I think I should have left it on. But it's it's no use regretting. It's past. It's done. So, so, so that's it. You were speaking in a number of languages earlier, but but, Deutsch, but you will Russian, you... Russian. Wait, Polish number one, Yiddish or oh, Yiddish number one, Polish. Uh, French, a bit of German, and a bit of Russian. I think, Staroy, Terry, Citeri, Piat, Ses, Seve, Vosem, Diviat, Desat, Yedenasset, Dvanasset, that's Ruski. So, with, with that, you you won't speak in German, is that correct? Uh, I understand. I don't like to speak German, but what was it like for you to go back to 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 well, Germany? To, yeah, and to go to the concentration camps in Poland. I did. I, I didn't go to Germany. I, yeah. I went. I went back to the camp, and 
it's, I was walking around showing my family that uh, walked with me and it, it was past. I knew I survived and I was happy and, and grateful to Hashem that I came out alive. It was, it was actually a dream now that I think, how did I survive? How? I don't know. I still don't know. I think it was a strength above me that Ruboyle Shiloilam has, has helped me, has carried me. They have called. Okay. I, I'm going to I'm going to ask everyone in a second, to, to Hanan, Gabby, and Jordi, to 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 almost share one lesson that you've learned from Ella. But before I do that, Ella, I want to talk about faith, because yes. there may, there are many people who went through experiences like yours, who lost their faith, but your faith still appears to be enormously it's, strong. It's stronger than ever, even stronger than before. That is an amazing gift. It is. It is. Because I know that's the only way that I survived. Because there was this force above me. Hashem. Reboi Nishiloilam was looking after me. Jordi, I want to ask, you told me to repeat a story. You told me a story about when you were filming Ella in, a, in the swimming pool. Ella, how far do you swim every day? I used to swim every day, but now it's a bit difficult. A bit of a Do you understand? No, first day. A little bit difficult because I'm a, no, not so old anymore. I want to say, I'm not so. Jordi, tell us the story of when you were filming Ella in the swimming pool. So, um, yeah, so the beautiful scene that you see in the, in the film where, where Ella's swimming in the swimming pool, we were, uh, you know, a lot of preparation went into it because we were, you know, a lot of uh, red flags were lit when we, we were thinking we were putting a 98-year-old woman um, in a swimming pool. We've got to be very careful. So... I approached Ella and I said, Ella, just, you know, get in the pool, take one lap. We're going to take it easy. Then we'll take a break. We'll film the next, the next take. And Ella said, absolute nonsense. And she, she jetted across the, the swimming pool and did, I don't know how many laps. And the camera was struggling and the crew was struggling to keep up with this 98 year old woman. And the camera nearly, we were also frantic. The camera actually nearly fell in the water, um, just trying to keep up with her. So just you know, remarkable strength and uh, and an attitude where she, she wouldn't listen to us. She wanted to to do it, and she'd do it um, her way. Hey, Kenora, 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 Kenora. So, Jordi, is that the lesson that you take take from the work you've done with Ella? I think definitely. There, there's so many lessons that 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 I can take, and I, I think there's also one amazing story that I can remember. And this happened during during COVID. Um, I heard this from Ella's from Ella's daughter Evelyn, um, and she was telling me when when COVID was going on, her and and Ella were outside on the balcony, and uh, and Evelyn's a, a medical doctor, so she was speaking to her mom about how terrible this COVID is, and was just really um, in a terrible state in a terrible way. And Ella just looked at her and said, "Just stop for a minute and look at this beautiful." sunset and this this beautiful view of the ocean in front of us just take a minute and and um just appreciate the beauty in front of you and I, and i think that's just ella you know she has this incredible way of um of seeing what what's almost impossible to us and just and i think that's also what's really just helped sustain her um during her times in the camps it's Gabby. the beauty of the world mm. Gabby. Give us one lesson that you've learned from working with Ella. Sure. Um, I think a, an, another lovely behind the scenes story that Ella touched on earlier is that she gave every crew member um, a nickname. And there were quite a few different crew members and everyone spoke different languages, but she took her time to 
introduce like to to meet each crew member member give them a nickname um she would even shout at the ones that were slacking <laughs> off because she noticed she noticed who was working and who wasn't working um but for me it's the way that Ella treats um each individual um notices them treats them as a person without prejudice and what has what has been so remarkable is when Ella speaks about the holocaust she very rarely says this is what the Nazis or the Germans, or she doesn't group who was the perpetrator, who was the victim. She says, look what humans did to other humans. And I think for me, it's just a reminder every day to look at us all as human beings, be treated, um, to treat other people as we would like to be treated, and to have that humility and that understanding after, go after going through one of history's darkest periods, um, if Ella can have that, then that's something that I try and add into my perspective. So, Hanan, how do we take these lessons from Ella and how do we inculcate that into our everyday lives? How, how do we take the wisdom of 101 years and make sure that our tomorrows are better? It's an incredible story. There's no question how she still has that amazing spiritual connection She's in the service of others. She knows what she wants. She's committed to everything is going to be okay. You don't mess with Ella. She stands her ground. Um, when you said Miller 17, she almost killed you through the camera. And uh, she corrected you immediately. And uh, one thing that, the one thing that was so prominent and everybody's seen it is her sense of humor. She is so funny. Uh, from, you know, challenging you, Howie, to a swim, to ending the call with Roma saying her tea is getting cold, that she doesn't like cold tea. She's able oh. to see the humor. <laughs> She's able to see the humor in any moment. And it's okay. It's okay to go through grief and loss and reminisce and, uh, and think about what could have been and should have been, but still have humor about it. Uh, Ella is the star of the show. Jordi and Gabby, you put together an incredible film uh, that's palatable to young and old, but Ella is the star of the show. She should be in front of every camera, of every microphone, telling her story and inspiring us, not just in terms of what has happened, but as human beings, what we can achieve and what we can do and be in the future. So Ella, I have two more questions and then we're going to wrap up the night. I need two. Only two, I'm permitting myself, because I told everyone they can go to bed by nine o'clock. But Tavos. You know, I lied a Tavos. little. Tavos. Exactly. Tavos me. <laughs> okay, well, let's start with number one. I, I want to know a little more about Roma today and your relationship with Roma today. That's the okay. question I'm going to ask. We're then going to show, show that one-minute documentary on the Holocaust and Genocide Center again, because we want everyone who's able to to make a donation in your name and your honor to celebrate your 101st birthday next Shabbat by making a small donation, even five rand, to the Holocaust and Genocide Center. And then I want to come back and talk about your birthday party and what you're doing next weekend. But be, so before we show that, talk to us about Roma, about your relationship with Roma today and, and the bond that you guys have. Wait, I couldn't stop you. I was going to tell you that unfortunately, two or three weeks ago, Roa passed away in New York. She was living in New York with her son. And she, she's gone. She's in a better world now. That's very, very hard. Yeah. Until, until the end, though, you must have been enormously close and enormously bonded, although not having lived in Maybe. the same country in, for many years. For many years. What did you say for many years? I didn't get it. That you, was... you, hadn't, you hadn't lived in the same country for many years. But the bond, the bond was strong. It's always, always remained the same. I actually had a son with his wife, they were here for the last few weeks visiting me and visit, traveling around the country and in the bushes. 
let let us watch the one minute on the Holocaust and Genocide Center again to enable people to make a donation in your honor to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And then let's come back and talk about your birthday party next week. Are you going to? I may come, I may come. But why? This Women's Day, it is an honor to be part of Ella Blumenthal's 101st birthday and to be part of this special screening of I'm Here. There are in South Africa only 20 to 25 Holocaust survivors and we need to capture all their story. We need to tell their story. We welcome schools from all walks of life every day to tell those stories, to remember, to educate, to learn lessons for humanity in order for the words never again to become a reality. So Ella, talk to, about, uh, uh, talk to us about Shabbat Nachamu next week. How are you celebrating 101 years? I don't know why I should celebrate. I should be just thankful to Hashem that I am, I'm still here. I need more. Did you understand what I said? I need more. Be great in Hebrew. Do, do, I'll give you a few it's the name of the film. I need Paul, I am here, and we've added in an 101 years old. <laughs> and to tell my story the way you did to help me show the film and to let me tell you, to let, let me talk about it. I can't believe if you ask me truly I can't believe it's me. It's a dream. I'm dreaming, but you're helping me. Thank you, thank you. Well, for Ella, from, for, from all of us, uh, really, Yom Huledet Samach, have to 120 and certainly beyond. And let everyone who's still watching us, and we've got thousands of people still watching us tonight on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Zoom. We ask all of you, if you haven't wished Ella happy birthday, take a moment now in the chat section on Facebook, on the chat section in YouTube, and the chat sec section on Zoom, and just wish Ella to 120 and beyond. We thank all of you for joining us from around the world this evening. It's been such an honor and privilege this Women's Day to celebrate the true power of a remarkable, remarkable woman. And to Hanan, to allow us to instill those fantastic messages that we've heard, and to Gabby and to Geordie, to allow us permission to absolutely see this work of genius. May you continue to win prizes around the world, and may you be picked up and make sure that this documentary about Ella's life is shown in South Africa, and around the world, so we can all learn and aspire to be just like her. Amen. 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 So, Sela. Amen. Sela. Amen. So, Amen. <laughs> so, just a reminder that a few things you can make a donation to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. I've put up a link on uh, the screen right now. It's www.jhbholocaust. .co.za forward slash donate, you'll be able to make a donation to honor Ella's 101st birthday. Don't forget, on the 18th of August, we're back with Sarai Kumalo, the first Black African woman to climb Everest, and we're going to talk to her about conquering Everest, Everest and life. And there's no secret, she didn't make it on the first attempt, and she didn't make it on the second attempt but she had resilience and she kept on trying until she did and she's got an amazing story to tell. And similarly, the amazing story of Bill Browder and his ongoing battle with Vladimir Putin, 
not just in Russia, but in the courts in the United States. And so much of what he told us about Russia seems to have come true in the vicious and brutal invasion by Russia on Ukraine. So join us on the 1st of September for Bill Browder as well. We're going to leave the chat open for a few minutes to allow you to make any additional comments that you want. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We'll see you on the 18th. Good night, everyone.